from somewhere in the depths of the sea, at 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 feet, in regions where sunlight almost ceases to exist, there is an echo of sound. A response to the pulse of the searching sonar, a chorus of answers to the sound sent down from passing ship and submarine. Who or what reflects that sound? This is the story of a search for something in the deep seas, something that creates the illusion of an ocean floor where no floor can exist. This is the story of an ocean phenomenon known as the deep scattering layer. It is a story that involves the scientists of the Navy and of the nation's oceanographic research institutions, men who seek new answers to old questions and in the process open doors to whole new worlds of discovery and benefit for mankind. Questions about the deep sea and the life that exists there are as old as mankind itself. Answers have begun to come only with the technology of the past few decades. Ancients saw the depths as the domain of monsters. Able to crush a ship with jaw or coil or tentacle. and return with helpless victims to their deep-lying lairs. Ancient and modern fishermen, dropping their nets on dark nights, have sometimes found strange forms amid their catches. Forms that recall the old stories and cause men to wonder about other shapes that may lie in the waters below. Not until the present century did men actually penetrate very far below the ocean surface. This was the beginning of a new urgency in the need to know about the undersea world. Man developed clever new listening devices, devices that could hear a submarine underwater. They heard a whole host of other sounds too, the sounds of life in the sea, the sounds of whales, of shrimp, of dolphins, the sounds of groupers and other fish. Man also developed the echo sounder, or sonar. A pulse of sound sent out from a speaker located in the ship's hull travels to the bottom and is reflected back to the ship. The echo, because the approximate speed of sound is known, the dial can be calibrated to read off the depth to the bottom. And a recorder can trace the bottom contour. Now man had a way to see for great distances beneath the ocean surface. The sea floors could be charted. From flat abyssal plains, there emerged hills, valleys, trenches. There also emerged some unusual seafloor formations, reefs and mounds. Above the ocean floor, in some echo sounder tracings, a second floor seemed to appear, or three, or more. Something in the sea was returning an echo, and that something was to be the subject of research and controversy for over three decades. The false bottom is obviously of great importance to the Navy, especially the submariner and the anti-submarine specialist. Scientists began extensive studies of these layers of sound return. They saw some layers migrate up at night, almost to the surface, and down again with the first light of dawn. This could be no physical change in the ocean. Only living organisms could migrate in this way. But which living organisms? Whales? Schools of larger fishes? Shrimp? Perhaps microscopic plankton? A number of theories were advanced, 
and oceanographers and marine biologists set out to find the source of the deep scattering layer. They were looking for an organism distributed over all of the oceans of the world, possibly in greater numbers than all of the animals on land. Was this a major new source of food for man? The organism certainly would prove to be an important link in the food chain of the seas. Information about it would add greatly to fundamental knowledge of life in the oceans and to the basic sciences of oceanography and underwater sound. But how do you study something several thousand feet deep in the ocean when you don't even know what you're looking for? Oceanographers developed elaborate nets to try to capture the deep scattering layer organisms. They attempted to position those nets just at the depth from which the sound scattering occurred. They lowered sound equipment in the layer to get close-up profiles of the reverberations. They lowered devices to test the water and others for sampling the ocean at the scattering layer depth to determine the water temperature, current strength, and chemical composition. In their nets, they found a variety of organisms. Some shrimp, a few small lantern fish, an occasional squid, and broken pieces of gelatinous matter similar layer fishes moved too fast to be caught in the slow moving nets or were too large or too small to be brought to the surface. And the controversy continued. Some researchers used explosive charges to provide a broad band of sound frequencies. Deep hydrophone this time. 3K, 4K, and 5K. We're waiting for shot number one, by the way. There she blows. Shot number one. The echoes were made visible and the researchers studied the effect of the deep scattering layer on the different sound frequencies produced. They found that for some reason, only certain frequencies or tones were returned. Studies of these echoes indicated that as some of the deep scattering layers moved upward, there was a change in the frequency of sound scattered. A layer might scatter sound at one frequency when at a depth of 3,000 feet, but at 500 feet, the frequency would be entirely different. Physicists and acoustic engineers began working on the problem. They developed further the basic theory of sound propagation and applied that theory to the conditions under which sound is scattered in the sea. They knew that sound is reflected in passing from one material to another of different density. For example, as sound travels in water, it is reflected from the hull of a submarine or from the ocean floor, or from the hard shells of shrimp-like creatures, or from the backbones of squid. They also learned that some fishes scatter sound, in this case because of resonance. These fish have swim bladders, internal gas bubbles which the fish use to maintain their level in the ocean. Sometimes sound waves make these swim bladders resonate and return a powerful amplified echo. At different depth levels, changes in water pressure and in the size of the fish's swim bladder affect the resonance phenomenon. At shallower depths, a lower sound frequency produces resonance. Scientists reasoned that changes in the size of gas bladders as fishes migrate up and down could explain why the deep scattering layer responds to different frequencies at different times. In the laboratory, acousticians bounced sound from bubbles of different sizes, and the results supported the theories of oceanographers who believed the deep scattering layer was caused by resonance in the swim bladders of fishes or other marine organisms. The question still remained which marine organisms. 
At the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Massachusetts, Dr. Richard H. Backus was working with one of the common deep water fishes, the lanternfish. Acoustical observations made here at Woods Hole about down sources showed quite conclusively that the essential scatterer in these layers is a bubble of gas. Therefore, we look for a marine animal that encloses such a bubble. Of all the animals in the sea, there are not too many that have this gas bubble. The suggestion 20 years ago now by the British ichthyologist N.B. Marshall always appealed to me. Marshall's argument ran like this. First of all, many species of land and fishes have this swim bladder, not all ocean fishes do, and are therefore good sound scatterers. Second, lantern fishes are widespread and abundant, uh, and so conform to the distribution pattern of the layers. Third, lantern fishes have the right depth distribution and make the daily vertical migration. At the Naval Undersea Research and Development Center in San Diego, Dr. Eric Barham was working with organisms called siphonophores, animals related to the Portuguese man of war. After they've been taken in the net and preserved, a siphonophore turns out to be quite a mess. But if you see them in the water, then there's something else again. They're quite handsome, about 30 inches in length, made up of a number of individuals. The important point, however, is the gas-filled individual here at the top of the colony. This is about the right size to resonate at the sound frequency used in echo sounders. Other scientists questioned the idea of resonating bubbles, stating instead that the hard shell of shrimp or other kinds of crustacea could scatter sound effectively, and the deep scattering layer could be accounted for entirely by these organisms. Mectophids you see here which have a gas bladder. Work continued, in the laboratories on shore and in the research ships at sea. More elaborate nets were developed. The depth of the trawl could be controlled more accurately. The catches from different depths could be separated. Many forms from the deep oceans were captured, but the question remained, which caused the deep scattering layer? In the 1960s, a new oceanographic tool, the deep submersible, made it possible to track the deep scattering layer right into the depths. Now, for the first time, man could venture down to see with his own eyes the creatures responsible for the sonar echo. The deep submersible could be fitted with many devices. Its own sonar to track down the mysterious echoes. Hydrophones to listen to the sounds of underwater life. Tape recorders to preserve those sounds for later study. Nets to sample the fishes found by sonar or hydrophone. Nets which could be tripped at will in the middle of a layer. The first practical deep submersible was the Trieste, and the first oceanographer to use such a vessel to study the deep scattering layer was Dr. Eric Barrow. In 1962, the Bathyscaphe Trieste had just returned from her record-breaking dive in the Marianas Trench to a depth of about 36,000 feet. The opportunity then presented itself to scientific dives. The question, of course, we wanted to, to put to the test was, could we observe and identify and count the organisms thought to be responsible for the deep scattering layer. We did it really quite simply. Way. We had a surface ship with its echo sounder going, making a record of the layers the time we were descending through them. And we'd simply observe and identify and count the numbers of organisms and record their depths in which they were sighted. We found that right away that we could see the little fishes that people had always suspected had been a cause of scattering layers, little metophids. We could see uh, things like crustaceans, such as the euphausids, or the larger shrimp-like sergested prawns. And then surprisingly, dive after dive, just at the level of the scattering layer, we saw a different kind of organism, a colonial form known as siphonophores, these gelatinous strings have a small gas-filled individual at the apex of the colony. And it turns out that these are just about the right size to resonate 12 kilocycle sound. 
obviously the only conclusion we could reach was that in the California current, Physonex siphonophores are the main cause of the scattering layer. The answer apparently had been found. But in the Atlantic, other oceanographers were at work. Dr. Backus of Woods Hole was using the deep submersible Alvin. The direct visual observations that my colleagues and I made of midwater sound scatterers took place in the little submarine Alvin in deep water south of New England in October 1967. In this case, the scatterers within the layer were gathered together in schools rather than being uniformly dispersed throughout the layer, as is the more usual case. We dove to layer depth as indicated by the surface ship's echo sounder. Uh, this was about 2,000 feet. Then we turned down the submarine's horizontally looking sonar to locate uh, a, a nearby school. We immediately saw several and chose one about 200 yards distant. Turning out the submarine's outside lights, we proceeded towards the school. When the submarine's sonar said range zero, we turned on the lights and looked out the viewing ports. We were in the middle of a fantastic fish school made up of thousands upon thousands of the little lantern fish called Ceratoscopolis matarensis. We repeated the same procedure about 25 times during the next few days, always with the same result. Although this was an atypical scattering layer, we suppose that other species of lantern fishes having other arrangements are responsible for other sorts of scattering layers. The final answer to the question of the source of sound scattering seemed to be getting closer and yet more elusive. Scientists from all parts of the world proposed and defended theories, but already the eventual answer to the question could be foretold. Dr. Barham had used the Cousteau diving saucer for another series of observations in the Pacific. He reported on a deep scattering layer that split up into several parts as it ascended toward the surface. In another part, there were siphonophores. Dr. Barham and Dr. Bacchus were both right. Dr. Bacchus summed up the situation this way. Anyone who expected a single simple answer to this problem was, was bound to be disappointed, and no one should be surprised by the results obtained so far. Furthermore, the question shouldn't be considered closed. It may yet be decided that other sorts of animals, in addition to certain fishes and certain siphonophores, are strong contributors to this midwater reverberation. A unique laboratory at the Navy's Undersea Research and Development Center, San Diego, is used to study underwater sound. The pool is 350 feet across and 38 feet deep. Sound coming from a transducer at the center of the pool travels out to the edge and is trapped under the concrete lip below the surface. This design prevents sound from echoing back from the edge of the pool and creates the effect of sound in the open ocean. Over the center of the pool, Navy technicians and scientists carry out their research projects. For this experiment, Dr. George Pickwell places a live fish in a pressure chamber. The sonar transducer will be aimed at the fish through the fiberglass pressure chamber, which is transparent to sound waves. Only the echoes from the fish will be picked up by the listening gear. The pressure in the chamber is gradually increased until it matches ocean pressure at a selected depth. The sound is varied from low to high tones. The return, or scatter, also varies in strength. 
Acoustician William Batzler explains. Here, now let's get some at uh, a little higher frequency. Turn it down just a little bit farther, Art. That ought to do it. Now let's have a look at the whole record. Now, sir, we have a strong resonant peak. If we had um, fish that were resonant at this frequency and a sonar at the same frequency, we could expect a strong response from the scattering layer. Uh, if the sonar were at a higher frequency, for instance, in this region, uh, we would not expect as strong a response under the same conditions. Dr. Pickwell is a marine biologist studying the swim bladders of deepwater fishes. This test will measure the volume of gas the swim bladder contains. gas volume of the bubble will now be matched with the resonant frequency that has just been found in the pool experiment. Just as in the case of these goldfish, the deep sea fishes utilize their swim bladders as neutral buoyancy trim tanks. This means that as they migrate upward in the evening, their swim bladders will expand with the decreasing pressure and they must resorb this gas in order to avoid bursting. Conversely, as they migrate downward in the morning with the scattering layer, they must resecrete additional oxygen to again reattain neutral buoyancy. We don't yet understand how they avoid the effects of this terribly high oxygen, which is normally lethal at a fraction of this value. Another organism utilizing a toxic gas in a deep scattering layer is the siphonophore, which secretes carbon monoxide for a flotation mechanism. Again, we do not yet understand how this organism can cope with the lethal effects of this dangerous gas ordinarily associated with automobile exhausts. We are hoping to find the answer to both of these problems in coming research projects. Dr. William Clark of the Westinghouse Ocean Research Laboratory studies the daily migrations of the deep scattering layer. Fish, when viewed from below in the ocean, are silhouetted against the downcoming field of light. And we think there's a relationship between the eyes and the photophores of these animals. The hatchet fish have permanently upward directed eyes and they appear to be using these eyes to silhouette their prey against the downward uh, field of light. Now in the case of the lantern fish, we find that the ventral surface of the body is covered with many photophores and these photophores emit a light which breaks up the silhouette of the fish and masks it against the lighter field of light coming down from above. If we were in the deep sea looking up, the lanternfish would appear like this with its light organs on. But a fish does not see as we do. He sees things like this. Since a lanternfish is seeking a light level where it can hide from its predators and still be able to see, it has to move as the light level moves. If the light level gets too low, the fish stands out like a beacon and it can't see its predators. While if the light level gets too high, the fish also loses its ability to hide. We have established that light keys the migrations of the deep scattering layer by using underwater sound to chart their migrations to and from the surface. But for others, the deep scattering layer is a real problem because it interferes with their underwater sound. The Naval Underwater Sound Laboratory at New London, Connecticut, Conduct Bell has a special concern with the deep scattering layer. In order to detect a submarine, our sonar sends out a pulse of energy or a sound burst, which is shown here as just arriving at the submarine. At this point, it will send back an echo to the sonar. However, you will see that the sound wave is hitting the deep scattering layer as well. This sends back echoes which constitute interference with the signal coming back from the submarine. Research on the deep scattering layer is important both from the point of view 
of the sonar system trying to detect a submarine and from the point of view of a submarine trying to hide from the sonar system. The information that is gathered from experiments on the deep scattering layer is fed back to marine biologists, fisheries people, and a broad spectrum of oceanographic interests. A research vessel takes station off the Atlantic coast in a Navy project called Ocean Acre. Involved are scientists from the Naval Underwater Sound Laboratory, the Naval Oceanographic Office, the U.S. Bureau of Commercial Fisheries, the Smithsonian Institution, and the University of Rhode Island. The ship takes station four times a year for five years. The scientists are attempting to learn all they can about this particular patch of seawater, its physical characteristics, and the life that exists here. They record the deep scattering layer on their surface sonars and the acoustic findings are correlated with biological studies. They bring up samples from nets. They see how life in the deep scattering layer changes with the seasons, and they relate these changes to the other oceanographic data they obtain. Ships and scientists from our own and other nations are at work in all the oceans of the world gathering information about the marine life that exists many thousands of feet below the surface. These men are at work, at sea and in their laboratories ashore, translating data into ideas, and ideas into programs, and equipment, and techniques. From what was once an echo of sound, a mystery from the depths of the sea, there has now emerged a storehouse of knowledge, knowledge that may one day contribute to the feeding of a population, the defense of a nation, the advances of medicine and biology. This has been the story of a search for the cause of the ocean phenomenon known as the deep scattering layer. It is a story that involves the scientists of the Navy and of the nation's oceanographic research institutions, men who seek new answers to old questions and in the process open a door to a whole new world of discovery.